In 2007, Singapore Airlines debuted the largest passenger airplane ever, the Airbus A380. Three, two, one, go! And it's massive, to say the least. This giant double-decker plane can fit up to 853 passengers. It's 239 feet long, 79 feet tall, and 262 feet wingtip to wingtip. Or, put simply, the length of two blue whales. Those who fly the A380 on airlines like Emirates and Singapore are treated with beyond luxurious accommodations. But today, many airlines have stopped purchasing the jet. And after the A380 completes its last few orders for Emirates, this Airbus will no longer be produced. So what happened to this fortress? Well, these days, airlines are actually thinking smaller. The narrow body plane, something from our past, is now dominating the sky. In 1970, Pan Am debuted this, the 747. The 747 was more than twice the size of Pan Am's previous standard, the 707. While the 707 revolutionized commercial flight, Pan Am's founder, Juan Tripp, wanted to go bigger, much bigger. So he reached out to his friend Bill Allen at Boeing to commission the 747. If you build it, said Tripp, I'll buy it. If you buy it, said Allen, I'll build it. So the 747, the queen of the skies, was born. It was a game changer and was known as the largest civilian airplane in the world. Just look at it compared to the 707. The plane was so big that Boeing had to create a new assembly plant to produce it. Beyond size, the 747 was revolutionary in other ways. It democratized air travel, making it more affordable and accessible for more people. These massive four-engine jets became the aircraft of choice for long-haul flights. But just as soon as they arrived, things began to change. Throughout the 1970s, technological advancements gave twin-engine planes the ability to fly farther. As the engines were demonstrated to be more reliable and have very low failure rates, then it became acceptable to let them go with longer ETOPS diversion limitations. Okay, quick pause. ETOPS is a certification that allows twin-engine jets to fly longer routes. Before, an aircraft had to be within 60 minutes of an airport to accommodate emergency landings. And at this point, we can basically fly almost anywhere on two engines without having to worry too much about the uh, diversion airports. Now you can take a international airplane or a oceanic airplane and fly it with two engines instead of three or four. Despite growing competition from smaller planes, airlines continued to purchase these jumbo jets for decades, until recently. So what changed? Well, a few things. First, let's start off with money. These aircraft don't come cheap. Prices vary, but typically, the Airbus A380 comes in at around $446 million, while the narrow-body A321 costs closer to $120 million. And not all airlines can even afford them. And those who can are dropping them, like Lufthansa and Air France, because of their sheer operating expenses. And they even take a toll on airports. Airports spent millions of dollars reinvesting in their terminal facilities, adding jet bridges, larger uh, baggage delivery systems, and tons of other passenger-focused improvements to make the A380 work and to tell carriers, hey, you can fly your A380 here. Plus, these narrow-body aircraft are more fuel efficient. So the idea behind it is these narrow-body planes, they have lower fuel burn. And by having this lower fuel burn, it means lower emissions. Now, it's important to recognize that super wide bodies like the A380 can actually be more fuel efficient. But that's only true if you can fill the airplane. If you're flying empty seats, it's, it's inefficient. But arguably, flexibility is the biggest incentive. It used to be this hub model where we fly from our hub in the US to either our partner's hub or one of our hubs over in Europe. And then from there, you can go and connect on to you know, your final destination. But smaller aircraft don't rely on the jumbo-sized infrastructure located at major hubs. This allows them to fly directly to and from smaller cities. 
It's what the industry calls point-to-point -point flying. It's desirable from a market standpoint. And for people like me who live in Boston, we benefit from more point-to-point -point service. Plus, narrow-body aircraft are capable of flying multiple flights a day. You can use them for a thousand-mile flight in the morning, and then the afternoon you can do a, a transatlantic and then come back and fly a, a domestic route the next day, right? Not only do prospective travelers get access to direct flights to smaller cities, but they also have a variety of departure times to choose from. While narrow bodies make up around 65 to 70 percent of airplane sales, some argue their popularity is simply due to market demands, like in a post-pandemic reality, aka fewer trips. I don't know if they'll continue to fly it in the long-haul flights. If demand comes back, um, you would you would switch to a bigger airplane. You switch to uh, a, a wide-body airplane or higher-capacity airplane. So it'll be interesting to see as we recover from the pandemic, if passenger traffic doesn't pick up as fast, will airlines pivot into a little bit more wide-body flying just to pick up that extra cargo capacity? But what if neither size is the future? Maybe there's something in the middle that fits just right. The 787 really enabled long haul, very long haul service. Okay, that's a wide body airplane. It has two, two aisles, but it, it will do what we call a thin market. So it's not, you don't need as much traffic in order to be able to fill the airplane. As of now, narrow bodies are seizing their moment and airlines are setting their sights on aircraft like the Airbus A220 for other long haul routes like from the U.S. to South America, Europe to Africa, or to the East. Guess we'll just have to keep our eyes to the skies. What do you think about these shrinking airplanes? Let us know in the comments below, and don't forget to like and subscribe.